this, I'm just going to come over to you. For instance, we're doing some research, and I saw that there's a bank in Kenya, the, the, a bank in Kenya that has over 20 million consumers, and Kenya has a population of just 43 million, so that's almost 50%. But we've not seen that same traction here in Nigeria. I mean, you've worked here for one year, you've also worked in Kenya. What, what is the difference? What can we learn? Okay, so... Um, thanks for that question. So, first, I want to just state that in my opinion, there is a disconnect between especially the digital consumer, the digital native. Digital natives are people who are born after 1980. I know more than 90% <laughs> of the people here are natives. There's a small disconnect between their expectations and what the bank is delivering. Um, in terms of, you know, banks have historically been wired around relationships that are human driven, that are done in physical locations. The, the new customer is looking for convenience. They want to bank from their homes. They want to bank from their bedrooms. You know, they want to do everything on the go. So, so there's that slight disconnect which banks are trying to you know, close. Um, one of the things that you know, banks have to do is to believe that they can serve customers without physically seeing them. So there's a bank in Kenya called Commercial Bank of Africa, they own a product called Mshwari. They have 20 million customers. They have less than 15 branches. Uh, in fact, if those customers were to go there to their branches, they will crush the branches. Uh, but they are serving those customers uh, today. Why? Because technology now enables banks to serve customers without seeing them. And that's basically what they're trying to do. So imagine in a population of 43 million, uh, one bank having 20 million customers who they, va uh, who they are actually serving virtually. Now, why the difference between Kenya and Nigeria? Um, you see, Kenyan banks had no choice. M-Pesa came in 2007, and it came with such a huge bank that banks had no choice. They had to change. What I see in Nigeria is that there hasn't been that banning platform that has made banks spend sleepless nights worrying about the customer who is disappearing, you know? Um, there is... Uh, there is, uh, you know, there, there is a book called Who Moved My Cheese? I'm sure a number of you have read it. Yeah, so the, w when there is a burning platform, you are like somebody being chased by a lion. So even, they say even if you break your leg when you're being chased. You still run. You just discover later that your leg was broken. You know? <laughs> um, now, the, so the Kenyan case is a case of where disruption happened from 2007. The banks realized that they were, they were struggling, that the numbers, I mean, customers were, were, were disappearing. Somebody did a comparison the other day um, uh, showing how M-Pesa moved from something like position six within the banking system to now position two. So only one bank is, has beat, is beating M-Pesa today. So, so I think that's a di the difference. And the regulator in Kenya has a very interesting mindset. The regulator in Kenya says, well, if what you want to do, we don't know what you want to do. You, you just try, then we see. <laughs> um, so that's a different mindset from saying, let's first analyze what you want to do, and then we allow you to do. Because to be honest, none of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, we, we try, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. So from what Mr. Julius is saying, I'm hearing him saying that the commercial banks are not under the pressure. They do, they've not yet given them that kick. Like the consumers have not yet said, we are hungry for X, Y, and Z product. But now, I don't know if you guys read the article that came out approximately one week ago about the CBN saying that they see fintech to be a threat to commercial bank. I'm going to throw that to you, Tosin. That is Tosin from Team Apt. Is that really a threat? Well, um, yes, actually. So um, if you have any group of people that are faster, understand the customers better, and you know, have like cheaper products, they typically are threats to incumbents. So from that angle, yes, fintechs are threats. But in reality, banks are not stupid, right? So 
banks will not actually fold their hands and watch these faster, nimble, cheaper guys eat the lunch. So in reality, what's really going on right now is that all the banks are setting up digital and fintech teams. And what these digital and fintech teams do is either build that product in a faster, nimble environment in a way that it will now be inculcated back into the mainstream bank, or they begin to pursue partnership with fintechs like us. And uh, Team Up as a company, the way we have been existing for the past years without you know, raising capital is by working with such banks. And what these banks do is, you come, build this product for me, we build the product, and you, you know, have commercial arrangements. So if I look at the fintech environment and look at the banking environment and I project in the next five years, I think what will happen is there will be a merger eventually. Uh, banks will probably acquire some fintechs that are real threats, and some fintechs will become you know, really great at you know, working together with these banks. Even your favorite fintechs today, most of them get their traffic from partnership with the banks. So um, will fintechs, you know, at least in the Nigerian situation, right, I think most likely what will happen is they will work together and they will collaborate. All and right. banks will also bring in that same culture because uh, They've existed for long and they are actually not stupid. All right. So, <laughs> Tosin is talking about initially he accepted that there was a threat, then further on he said there will be a collaboration. Mr. Deji, do we see a threat or are we seeing a collaboration? Should I speak from a selfish perspective? All right. You can global? speak personal, <laughs> then go global. That's fine. Okay. Well, um, from a bank perspective, I'll say um, fintechs are. Uh, we don't see them, see them as threats, but we see them as um, partners, more, more or less. And we also consider ourselves to be maybe the largest fintech, and not really a bank. So um, what we do, or what we're doing right now, is we're actually looking at them, okay, what are the fintechs, like Tosin said, what are the fintechs who have products, services of value that we can offer our customers? And then we approach those fintechs, or they approach us, and we work out something together. So um, we see more collaboration in this space rather than um, considering anybody as threats. The threats I would say I've been looking out for are the Googles and Facebooks. Honestly, those are my threats. Mm -hmm. So we are not there yet. All right. This is not something for us to worry. How about the global perspective? We're talking about the Google and the, and the others. They are the ones that we actually see as threats. Yeah. Interesting. How many times have you, uh, have, have you actually heard of FinTech, FinTech? Have we actually scratched the surface? Are we creating the products that people want in terms of distribution? Are you meeting those needs? I'm coming back to you, Tosin. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. The, the question again, sorry. Say that again. The question again. Question. Okay, so I'm saying that we keep talking FinTech every day, but in terms of product, like how much of those products do we actually have? Have we addressed those needs? Have we actually gone out to create is it just the same yeah. circulation of those few products that we keep calling okay. fintech? All right, so with one of our banks, we actually did like a, a focus group, and we called people of different personas into a room. You know, students, working class individuals, different people, and we wanted to hear from them. You know, some things came out, aside the typical, which bank do you bank with, bank this, bank that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to mention the names. <laughs> the other things that they requested for, which gave us an idea of where the disconnect are, one, charges. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, now, when a, when, when a consumer is saying that, I'm not happy, one of the reasons is you just get a debit alert for one reason or the other. The second thing is ease of loan. It came out strongly. I have this business idea, I want to do this, I want to do that. Why can't I just get 500k or 1 million from a bank? Another one is support. How quickly can I get an issue resolved? And another, so those are the three major things that came out. Yeah, there are other things like savings. Now, if you look at these three things, charges today is borne by the fact that you are doing your transaction with the bank. If you switch your transaction to a fintech, it's likely that they will charge you lower than the bank, or maybe even higher, but you get better service. But these fintechs don't have the regulatory backing to do that yet. So let's put charges. Charges probably still come from the banks. Now let me look, look, talk about loans. So you, in the recent times, there are now you know, new classes of quick loans that are coming, and people, maybe one or two people here are already borrowing there. You can just dial a short code and you get your loan disbursed in a space of like 30 minutes. 
Now, these are some of the, the products that are coming out that banks are not bringing. Now, you need to now look at unit economics. You see, at the end of the day, banks are commercial entities, and they want to make profits. So, and this is how disruption really, really still happens, because there's a book called Myth of Innova Myth, uh, 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 Innovator's Dilemma. Essentially, what happens is that because you have this need to increase your margins, to make sure that you make the necessary money that you need to make, you don't focus on some of these small change. And what just happens is that some fintechs will come in, pick that small change, do it very well, hold it in a way that you can't get them again, and now begin to move into the big changes. So I would say the kind of products that are you know, coming out now from fintechs are the kind of products where the banks are not set up to do them because they are small, small change, or they are risk averse. Do you understand? And those are the kind of products that you are seeing out there right now that fintechs are doing. But also, I know with a couple of banks, they are already now adopting these models. For example, in some banks now, you can dial a short code and get your loan instantly. Now, and with another bank now, you can do the same savings that you do with your favorite startup almost the same way. So what is causing this essentially is the unit economics that needs to be taken care of you know, from the bank. And the products also are out there that these fintechs are bringing out to address these problems. Okay. Mr. Julius, from a commercial bank perspective, would you agree with Tosin? <coughs> okay, yeah. I, I, I fully agree with Tosin. Um, you know, me and Tosin usually have a lot of arguments because he's from <laughs> fintech, I come from bank. Now, the, the thing is, and he's the one who taught me this, he told me three things. Cheaper, faster, easier. Easier. You know, he kept hammering that, I think, last year. Yeah. You know, easier, faster, cheaper. So that's what we need to address because all these people here, what they are looking for is services that are easier, faster, and cheaper. And they want them wherever they are. Now, the way the bank is wired today, we may not be able to do all those things immediately. Mm -hmm. That's where fintech come to help us. So the whole idea about working with fintechs is that they are more nimble. You know, they don't have a lot of legacy issues. They can change things overnight. As we need to go for serious committees, you know, to change things. So because of that, there's a lot of leverage of the, of the culture of a fintech to bring it to banking. Because remember, in the next 10 years, this is one of the statements I like dropping anywhere. In the next 10 years, if a bank is not a software company, most likely it will die. And these are the people to help us to move, you know. These are the guys to help us to move, you know, that cultural shift into software-driven business model, which is, which is what the consumer of today is. All right. So still dwelling on the issues that consumers want. I am an advocate for consumers. We're talking about cheaper, faster, better. Talking about easier. I'm going to come to you, um, Adivanjo. I went to the filling station the other day. I wanted to pay for petrol, and then I swiped my card, and then it failed. And then I went to the nearest ATM. There was no cash. And I've heard a lot of people talk about this. The other time, I went for a friend's um, name is Sarah. I wanted to get some cash to give the baby. And in the neighborhood, there was no ATM. It happened. It got to some point that there are some individuals that actually have cash with them. Then they, you pay a bit of a premium to get that cash. How are we solving this issue of it being easier? How can I actually have faith that I have my card and I will always get cash anywhere, or I can do a transaction and then it's going to go through? How do we solve this issue of it being easier? Okay, I'll start with, my name is Omoke. Omoke. <laughs> my last name is Adibanjo. All right, sorry about and that. And then I'll go that um, into wh who MasterCard is. So MasterCard, although we had card in our name, we're really a technology company. Okay. We work through Julius and Deji to deliver our services, as well as Team Apt, um, because we work with banks, we work with non-banks, governments, and tech companies to deliver our services. So if you couldn't get money to give the baby at the naming ceremony, or you couldn't get money to, give, to um, pay at the fueling station, we need to ask my friends that have spoken before me. <laughs> <laughs> But, 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 that, but, that's not the, but, but that really is not the point here. 
because I would say, and in fairness to all the partners that we work with, which is really all the banks and a lot of fintechs in Nigeria, I think they're doing a very good job. And I say this not because I'm Nigerian and I'm sitting with them. I say this because I have the privilege of working for a company that is in 210 countries around the world. Um, and I look after five countries in West Africa. So I can compare a little bit. And I'd like to give kudos to everyone on the stage and everyone not on the stage for how they've managed to work within Nigeria and the challenges we have to deliver what they have delivered. I will take your question a bit and flex it. And I'll say that your question is really, how do we get payment to work for everyone seated here and not seated here? Because it's about payment, you see. I say that I cannot struggle to make money and struggle to spend the money. What happens is that we struggle, we work so hard and then we get payment friction. So let's remove card from it and talk about payment, regardless of the form factor. Be it mobile, be it contactless, be it, even if you want to pay with a bottle of water, where in the age where the form factor doesn't matter, what matters is everyone like us behind the payment. So how do we make payments better? I think, I think it's really from conversations like this and from partnerships between banks and fintechs. We have a privilege of sitting in the middle. Mastercard has a program called StatPath, where we take 30 fintechs every year around the world and we take those fintechs and take them to banks and we say partner. And we've seen beautiful relationships and a lot of money come out of these um, partnerships. So we see a world where fintechs and banks will coexist. Are they a threat? Yes. They're a threat for everything you've said, but also the fact that when you're nimble and fast, you see those processes, that's what protects your money, that your money doesn't disappear from the bank. You, it, there, there's a balance between being fast and nimble and really smart and doing things quickly and also being steady and following processes and being organized. We want to be right in the middle where we use the strength of fintech as well as the strength of banks. And that's the only way we're going to solve the payment problem. We've tried. I don't even know why we're, why we're even arguing between fintech no, and no, banks. No, 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 we're not arguing. The consumers <laughs> don't know this and we want to hear. You know, you know okay, so fair point. All of us, everything we've done, all the fantastic fintechs in Nigeria and the really smart bank, we still have an unbanked population that is over 60%. Absolutely, and I was, I'm getting there. So we haven't even started. Instead of looking at, and this, this friction, I think the friction we talk about in quote is more external than internal, that most of the time fintechs are in and out of bank offices. They're partnering. There are lots of products that you're seeing that are coming from the banks that are white labels, really. Yeah. And there's a lot of learnings fintechs are taking from the bank. But let's stop the talk and do the work. Fantastic. Great. So where do, does the work start from? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was coming to you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Your mic. We can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I would say the work starts from, uh, if you want to build a house, you have to start from the foundation. Uh, we all look at uh, the incredible innovation we see worldwide, but sometimes the thing we don't look at is what are the things that made those things to happen. Now, when you look at big companies like Facebook, Google, and the rest of them, they wouldn't have been around if there was no internet. At one time, some people worked together to put internet in place. Now. Over the many years I've worked in banking and outside of banking, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of, I've known a lot of very smart people, incredibly smart people, who have great ideas about what they could do to either make payments to be faster, cheaper, and easier, or to take payments to the 60% that Omoke mentioned. But most often than not, their ideas are light of the day because when they see what they need to do to talk to different banks, then it becomes impossible. For those of us that have done projects with banks, sometimes your projects will last years. Now that we are talking about one bank, now multiply that by 22 banks. And I can tell you even on this stage, uh, if you like, see the likes of Omoke and the other big players, they even grapple with these challenges. Talk less of the small young guy that is in maybe year three in university, or the young girl that just finished uh, maybe secondary school is playing with code and who wants to bring a nice idea out. So it's on the basis of this that 
uh, together with a lot of, of my friends and colleagues in the industry, we created something called the open banking. And the whole idea is we believe that if fintechs and young people can easily connect to banks and do all the smart things they want to do, they can spend more time taking their products to the customers for faster, cheaper, easier products than having to talk to banks. Big companies like where I work and where Omoke works, where Tosin works, can afford to pay developers, pay business development officers, pay different people for years, hoping something will come out. But the guy that doesn't have even maybe 10,000 in his account, who's going to help him? So the whole idea, we believe that when we solve the problem of infrastructure, where there is an easy way for everybody to integrate in a common standard, I think the explosion of innovation we see in Nigeria and in Africa will be beyond what we can understand. Now, when we look globally, when we talk about China, for example, people talk about Alipay, people talk about uh, WeChat, Tencent. They, we can see scale that is beyond us. Alipay has about 520 million users on its users. And then you have 10 cents on WeChat, have about a billion people doing payments on their platform. The question is this, why can't we have the same thing in Nigeria? When we're talking about doing fintech products, I have a thousand people, I have a million people, that is nothing compared to the 190 million people we have in Nigeria, where 60% don't even have access to payments or they have access to financial services. Okay. So, speaking about open banking, this has been embraced in other parts of the world, in UK, in Australia, and I know that you guys are working on a project to close it. How close are we in getting there, in solving that issue? How close is open banking in, in getting to his mile goal? Okay, I can tell you that, uh, to be realistic, open banking is, is happening in a few countries. It's not still very common, but you see Europe leading, yeah. and the UK, like you mentioned, is Australia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and some other places as well. It's taking years for them to get there. Mm -hmm. So for UK, it's taking about two years and to get to open banking, which they launched in January. PSD2 are the same thing. Open banking, I just started last year, and so far we have a significant um, level of progress. First, within the banking industry, everybody is aware of what open banking Nigeria is. Uh, we work with the banks and other uh, stakeholders to define API standards. And now we're working, with, we're working on the next stage. And the next stage will be to build our sandboxes, uh, have advocacy with governments and the central bank, because we need the government and the central bank to work with the banks to say, let's do this. Because it is, since it's a national standard, it is not something just one bank can do by itself. It's got to be done by everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So I, was, I spent so much time just looking at what Open Banking is doing, and I'm quite um, impressed. Well done. So, to Mr. Deji, we're talking about financial inclusion, like many people still are unbanked. And I know we've had this, I mean, from ages we've been having this conversation, and we ancient, we're getting there. But this theme of this session is the future. Where are we going? How do we get those people into the system? Or do you think they don't need to be in the system, and there are other ways to actually address this? I mean, what's your take on this? Well, I have uh, different perspectives. That's fine. Um, my first perspective is, um, do they really want to be banked? Good question. That's um, one question we need to really ask. Are we just trying to shove something down, down their throat? And um, in asking that question is, um, okay, how or what do they really want to do? And that is actually, we have to understand what does the consumer want? So we need, we need to really go down deep and really find out what they really want and then give them what they want. But um, I think financial inclusion has become a buzzword, and um, um, the way we are looking at it now is that we're just trying to shove things down the consumer's throat, and the people, the regulators are pushing to do it are not the right people, because most of them are business entities who want to make profit. You really need to spend a lot of money for financial inclusion to really happen, and um, to spend that money, government has to be involved. It is, not, it is not, let me say, not a viable business venture as of today. There has to be a lot of government participation, government commitment to make this happen. And after a while, we'll pass the tipping point, and then it becomes a commercial venture. But at the beginning, where we are right now, I think we're just paying lip service. 
Fantastic. All right, so if we were to actually get that funding or do that work, how, what, what, what break-even period would you look at before it actually becomes a profitable to actually get those people in? Well, it, it, it depends on, on, on how government um, throws its weight, its weight behind it. For example, there can be forced adoption. You can say all payments of this sort can only be via this method. If all payments of this sort can be via this method, then it will accelerate that, that, that growth, and then the break even will be faster. And our government can say, okay, I'm allocating X amount of money every year to make this happen. I want to establish A, B, C, D agents in this area and put their weight behind it. So actually, the, the, the major factors that will make it quick all are in the hands of government. In the hands of government. Yeah. All right. Julius, would you agree that the government actually has to call the... Okay. Yeah. So let me give Kenya an example. Maybe using, Hello. maybe using Kenya, we can answer the question on financial inclusion. So the key, you know, financial inclusion is about distribution. It's about last mile banking. If you look at, for example, in Nigeria, the financial inclusion is worse as you go to the north, as you go towards the north. That's where more people are excluded. Now, when I look at the numbers in Nigeria, this is what I see. There are about 20,000 odd agency banking points in Nigeria. If you, if you total all the top agency banking operators, and you remove the deprecation, you'll probably come up with a figure of maybe 20,000 odd number of, of agents in the market today. Now, this market has 190 million, 200 million people. In Kenya, we have around 150,000 agent locations, and we are only 43 million. So that's what has pushed us to about 80% financial inclusion. So the work that uh, my friend is talking about is actually the work to build that distribution from that 20,000 20, number to something like, in my opinion, nothing less than half a million agents will even create a dent in Nigeria today. And that, that distribution is not, um, it's, it's an expensive affair. Uh, so I, I think uh, see, uh, the, the central bank has realized that there is a challenge, and I think they are doing something to help the banks to do it. But we have to be very clear that the only way to scale financial inclusion is to sort out the last mile distribution last mile. through agency bank. All right. Okay, maybe I should. I'd like to contribute to that question with your kind permission. Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I want to um, accentuate what Deji said. He said, do they want to be financially excluded? Because, included. Because these people are, perf they're, they're doing commerce. Money is being spent everywhere. And they have some way of doing life that works for them. They might not have a bank, but they have somewhere where they contribute money every day. A job, or whatever you call it in whichever language you're speaking. I think we need to solve a product problem as we solve the distribution problem. I know that we're grossly, the distribu distribution channels are grossly inadequate. Um, if you look at any country in the world, Brazil, India, regardless of what country, they, it might not be agent, but our financial distribution points are grossly inadequate, and we need to fix that. But the answer is not necessarily, and I'm not saying the answer is that is wrong, this drive to build um, agents around the country, I'm saying we need to solve the product problem as well. How do they want to be served? The people that are financially excluded don't think they're missing out of life. They think cash is perfect for them because cash is immediate. You can touch it. You know, it's nobody's going to come and give you a debit alert because of your cash. So they think they don't have a problem. From the outside, maybe because we've done some research, everybody seated here, we know that it's not the perfect way to do life. We know that they're paying more for loans. If you hear how much interest, if you calculate it bank-wise, the interest these people pay on small loans, if any bank in Nigeria try to charge that, they will shut that back down. But they're paying it because they're not calculating the money. It doesn't look like a lot, but they're paying way more they should have been paying for loans, only because they're excluded. 
It's building that bridge between someone that thinks their life is perfect and people that know that we can do better. But we can't do it without understanding their life and how it works. It's all well and good we put mobile banking agents in every country, every state in Nigeria. But we also have to do that with technology as well. Are the transactions going to be offline? Because if they're not offline and data goes down, what happens? Those are the things, I think it has to be a cohesive, and we shouldn't just model Kenya fantastic, but Kenya had a demand problem. I'm not Kenyan, but my understanding is there were people working in the townships and needed to send money home. There was a problem statement that needed to be solved. Therefore, it made sense when M-Pesa came in, and people, because they needed money at home, would pay the probably expensive rate of M-Pesa without thinking about it because a problem was being solved. We need to determine the problem you know, with the unbanked. We need to find out which product fits their lifestyle. Then we also, alongside, need to do the distribution thing. But we can't do it without everyone seated here and government. I hear you that government has to participate. But private sector and every other person needs to invest long term in solving this financial inclusion problem. There's no money in it immediately. But if this is a wealthy path and I use wealthy very loosely. This is, if you see how much they're paying for services right now, this is a part where everyone here on this side of the table can do good business when they finally see the point of what we're talking about. That will be my contribution. I'm going to still come back to you, I'm okay. So I've heard it's not profitable in the short term, no, but now not. you're coming saying, you know what? They are actually paying already for it. Yes. Let's teach them. Let's yes. show them. Yes. Let's make that money. Yes. So in actual fact, if we build this product, collaborate in the long term, it's possible. Yeah. Yes. It's possible. Yeah, I, I think it's possible. And let me accentuate that it's not profitable in the short term. The way we're set up, and that's why we need these fintech banks and think of new products that are out of the box. The way we're set up, it is not profitable for... I know we keep on hitting banks and saying they're just making money. But for that free ATM transaction you do, those three free ATM transactions, they're paying for it. It's not free to them. They're paying people behind the scenes for it. Each ATM is, I don't know how much it costs. They spend million. X million keeping that ATM up. If they put that ATM in a village where they're not going to get utilization for it, it is not profitable for them. Which is the reason why the products of the future and the products for this segment are going to come from fintechs and fintech banks. They're going to come from partners like Massacre that are thinking out of the box. Those products will need to be radically different and very low cost. And we're getting there slowly. You are seeing mobile do radical things. You are seeing us go to QR payments. Why? Because you need something that will be almost free to serve these people. Use the mobile in your hand to scan a QR code that the most expensive it could ever be is probably a thousand naira. Because what are you doing? You are printing out a code on a, plus, on a laminated sheet. But that's not even cheap enough. We've done that, we need to work harder to bring cheaper but smarter products that fit the lifestyle of these people and then we will be in business for a very long time, and so yeah. will they. Yeah. I like where this conversation is. Oh, you were okay. trying to say something? Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> my perspective on this is, um, while I agree on the cost that banks are spending money, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the short-time view that banks are using. Uh, there is somebody that used to say something, say, your margin is my opportunity. <laughs> Today, we talk of financial inclusion. The reason why, at least from my own experience, that people that are excluded don't use electronic transactions is that it's actually more expensive for them than for the people that are even included. Today, I can put money in my savings account or current account for free. When you do mobile money, you tell these guys to, put, to pay $100 to put money in his account. Now, this is someone who has struggled to save a thousand for that day, and he's going to use ten thousand, one a ten percent, to put money. I don't think there is anybody here today who wants to put fifty thousand in his account, and then the bank will tell him they are going to charge him five thousand naira. He will not take his money to his under his mattress. <laughs> Am I right? 
Meanwhile, when you look at the banks, how much does it cost them to do this transaction? And I can answer these questions because I worked 16 years in banking. Today, if I tell you there's a business that will give you 400% instantly, you'll probably tell me I'm a 419. But that's the business the banks are doing. Today, the <laughs> it, it, cost, it cost the banks 10 naira maximum to do an interbank transfer. But then they turn around and charge the customer 50 naira. <laughs> now, but, but, look, but, look at, but look at it this way. <laughs> but look at it this way. When interbank transfer used to be, when interbank transfer used to be 100 naira, Yes. All the banks in the country about two years ago were doing 7 million transfers a month. Now, because it went down to 50 naira, they started doing as much as 54 million transactions a month. Now, imagine when if transactions could be as cheap as 10 naira to transfer money to someone. It means that instead of giving out cash for 200 naira, I can actually transfer money to Adamu, I can transfer money to my driver, I can transfer money to they may guard and transfer 200 to them, and it doesn't make any difference to me. Now, when I transfer money to that person, invariably, they will be forced to enter into the what? Into the financial space. Look at telephone. <laughs> now, so let's, let's, let's look at telephony. When MTF first came to Nigeria and the telcos, the SIM card was 20,000 naira, and only the rich people had it. But when SIM cards, the cost of SIM card dropped, I think right now it's like actually free. It's free. Every single person have at least maybe two, two <laughs> SIM cards. Now, what, what have you seen? There is everybody now calls everyone. Now, it may not be that everybody is making phone calls, but at least there's a network effect. If the cost of transaction goes down significantly, even, I will even say let's even be free for transaction, let's say below 1,000 naira, we will achieve at minimum of 90% 90, 90 financial inclusion in the next one year. Okay, right. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I think Julius you want to add something. Yeah. I, I, just, I, just, I just want to. So I want to say something. Thanks, uh, Deji, for that. Now, I want to point something around product. I just want to set uh, some clarification on product. Yes. My opinion is that the people who are excluded, they don't, hear, they don't even have the financial services. Yes, they have the local, the way they do local. <coughs> but let me give you an example. One bank in Kenya in 2014 launched a, a loan on mobile. Now, it wasn't a new product, so to say. It was just they were able to layer the loan on mobile. Now, this is what they found out. They found out that between 8 a.m. and about 7 p.m., the curve of people borrowing was generally flat. Mm -hmm. Between 7 p.m., around 8 p.m., to about midnight, they found a spike. Now, remember, banks have already closed their doors. Yeah. They're at home. <laughs> between 4 a.m. and about 7 a.m., they found the longest spike. So ask yourself, who are these people who are borrowing money at 4 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> now, we joked about it. In fact, at some, mo at some point, we said, this must be men. <laughs> we had, you know, that in mind thinking about why people are borrowing at 4 a.m. But when we, dig, we dug into the data, we discovered that these are micro-enterprises borrowing money to buy milk and bread to go and sell so that they can pay the loan later in the afternoon. And we found out that that portfolio of 4 a.m. was the best performing portfolio. Of course. Because the people are buying early morning at 5, then they are selling and they are paying the loan. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, what did the bank do? The bank only leveraged a distribution channel, which is a mobile, to extend the banking service. The product was already there. There are many banks in Kenya who have not done it. Do that they don't have a product to do that? No. It's just that they are not thinking that inclusion is about sorting out the, the distribution problem, you know, getting the product to the people. Today, people don't have that access to, to, the, to the product. Fantastic. So from what we've heard, we can see... <laughs> we, 
we can see that there is, we want more products. We need to leverage on what the consumers want and then create a product for that and also drop costs. You know, I did, a, um, I did a survey on Money Africa some months ago and I was telling people that why are they doing Agile, that if there are 12 people in a group, the person that donates, the, contributes the money on the 12th month has actually given people money without earning any interest, that they've lost, you know, they've lost the potential to earn interest. And it was on social media and it went viral. And they came for me, that is a lie. Which bank would give you interest? So you can see that there's a, bit of, there's a distrust. So these are the kind of things you need to start addressing. How do you actually get the consumers to trust in you, to know that you have their back, you know, we've got you. That, kind, that is the message we actually need to be, you know, pushing more because it, if you look at the math, it makes sense that if you're actually putting your money in a job, if you're collecting it last, if you are putting it to the mutual fund account, you could have actually earned an interest in as opposed to just getting the same money you had put in back. But we need to push the trust. Guys, we have approximately seven minutes left. From everyone, please just kindly tell me what you think the future is and where we are going. I know you've all said it in different words. Make it quick, make it brief. Five, five sentences. Okay, so the future five is... Five words. <laughs> I'm the kidding, winner words, will yeah. make it easier, faster, and cheaper. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, for me, I would say the future of banking is open. It's open. All right. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. For me, I see, I, see, I see a very bright future. The banks have realized that they need to change, um, particularly... Uh, <laughs> Please don't laugh. I mean, I'm, I'm just being honest. So the banks are changing. Um, that's why you see most banks now are omnipresent in all these events. Uh, that's why you see us sponsoring this event as FCMB, because we think that the future is now. The customers, in fact, the people that I see on the floor, these are actually these are all digital natives. So they don't want they don't want to come to branches. They want to access things remotely. Now the phone is only becoming more powerful. In the next two years, each of us will have at least 11 devices that are in interconnected. Today, maybe you have three, so look for another, another nine. <laughs> your fridge will be connected, your window will be connected, your door will be connected. So, <laughs> okay, I'll say um, the future is everyone, every one of you here. Um, we need to understand how to meet you at your points of need, yeah. and um, that will make a great future for us. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think the future is digital, um, and I agree with you that everything will be connected, even your cars and your fridge. I think that fintechs are here to stay. Yes. I think that banks are not going away, yes. and I know that MasterCard will be in between both of them. <laughs> <laughs> So Omake is not only the head of West Africa, I can see she's also a fantastic marketer. <laughs> All right, guys, five more minutes. Do you have any questions, anything, pressing needs? We can take just three people. So three people, one, two, I want another lady. I want a lady, one okay. more. Okay, okay, we've got, okay, is the ice, excuse me? All right, any lady, we have three guys. Anybody, any lady want to ask a question as well? All right, we'll go with the three guys. So, so please don't forget, don't forget the rules, 30 seconds, please. I know we have a fine woman on the panel. Don't tell me again. I beg you. And you shouldn't. I'll tell you what. If you say that in the West, I know what will happen to you. <laughs> just me saying. Just me saying out loud. Please, 30 seconds. Keep to the 30 seconds. Okay. I appreciate you. We need to have a lady. We need to have inclusion. You know? Come on. One we person. We Can we get a lady here, please? Ladies! Oh, yeah, run out. Come, come outside, forward. please. I can see somebody on the yeah, back. <laughs> we need to balance it out. We need to have some level of inclusion. It's really important. So just a lady, who gets here first? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we'll be magnanimous enough to take two of them just to, to mix it up a little bit. Please, Good day, it's everyone. a woman's world. Thank you. I want to find out what will be the if, what is the effect of blockchain in the backend system. Okay. Effect of blockchain. You know what? You know what? Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. We will answer that question. We'll step it down. 
Because my very good friend, Emeka Okoye, is, is actually talking about cryptocurrency and blockchain in Nigeria. So he's going to answer all of that when he comes to a presentation. So we step that way. It's fine. It's fine. Just pass on the microphone. It's fine. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamilo Radebayo. Physically and technologically, what are banks doing to include persons with disability in their operations? Thank Excellent. you very much. Okay. Excellent question. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Joshua, and I would like us to please quickly ask a very quick question. They are, and um, it will be from the perspective of the second to the last person and the second to the last person. And it's simple, Joshua, please. Joshua, I my please, question. I beg you. Once it's 30 seconds, I take that mic from you. Okay, my That's question is, idea. please, how do we exclude the big boys from the banking sector and fintech? He said, he mentioned something, he said that the cost, the reason, the cost of um, executing transactions from bank is actually lesser than what they collect from us. And I think it's because of what the other man from this extent is saying Great. that there are, the government is actually waiting, there are big boys on the back end waiting to collect a large chunk from them. Is it possible for us to exclude fintech from banking from these big boys so that we get to have to eat the bigger portion of our bread? Thank you. Last question. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vivian. Okay, my question is this. Um, how open are banks to um, the ideas of uh, fintechs that are not really big enough yet? Like, how open are they? Like, Thank you so much. Them? So, start up fintechs. So, so, let's just go straight to the questions. Okay. And, uh, um, in my experience, I will answer the lady. In my experience, uh, uh, everything we started, and we've not raised any funds till now, so that really exactly. means that we started yeah, being very, you very little. Excellent. I think if you have a bright idea and you can actually solve a pain point, for most banks, you can actually op walk into their door and they will listen to you. And I have been fortunate to actually have some of the people that helped us in TMAP on this seat. For example, when Deji was in one of those banks, he actually listened to me. I practically chased the man down, you know, to say, this is what we are trying to do. And he gave us the chance. We built it free, free which allowed us to actually now have a point to other banks to say this product works here. So to everybody that is aspiring here that you want to build your own company and you are thinking these banks will not listen to me, they are being, please just bring the courage on. Go to the banks, tell them this is what you want to do. They will listen to you. If you have a working product, I'm telling you that you will actually sell it to them. Okay. Next question, please. Will you question. We'll take that in this, uh, the, the two panel sessions from okay, now. Okay, so somebody else asked a question about how can the government, how can we exclude the government because they are the, the one who get money, you the understand? Big boys. The big boys. The big boys. The big boys. Okay. Big so you're saying there's a cabal, from what you said, it sounds okay. as if there's a cabal. There is no, okay, I will answer that question. So there is no cabal because uh, the cost of transaction in Nigeria is regulated by the central bank. And once in a while, let's like say every three years, they come around and they bring out new fees. But the fees charged is usually a compromise because the banks will want to demand for more to charge the customers. The government wants it to be cheaper. What we want or what the country needs actually is a forward-thinking bank or a regulation that can allow non-banks to be able to provide these services. Because if you go to India, if you go to China, the biggest players in some of these transactions are not banks at all. Because the way banks are, they focus on the big money. They, are, they still don't understand the need of the everyday man on the street. So the only thing we can do is to keep pressure on everybody to say, let's reduce this cost. Because you can't, charge, you can't be charged 10 naira, then you turn around and charge the next person 15 now for that kind of transaction. It's not just fair. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. The next answer. So the, the third question was about cost. Cost. Yeah. He spoke about um, having the cost from ATMs. Oh, I think he the, kind the, of that was still tied to the already answer. Answer. He has already answered so, it in both questions. So, so, so good. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this session. I enjoyed it. That was still one. Disability, people who live in oh, with the disability. Oh, the people with disability. Oh, we're sorry. Disability. Will you go for okay, that? Okay, let, let, me, let me answer that. Um, I'll answer from a digital perspective and also from a physical perspective. 
um, for example, Guaranty Trust Bank, all its branches have, have, have access for disabled people. We have ramps where you can come into the, where you can come into the branch. But for disability, in terms of, okay, um, impairment and all that, in, in, for physical areas, there, there's, there's biometrics, and we are working on some biometric um, solutions which will work digitally. Therefore, I'm um, sorry? No, go. Okay, go so I'm working on biometric solutions which will help disabled people will draw money from the ATMs and also use their mobile phones. So from a physical perspective and also a digital perspective, that's what um, we are doing um, as a bank. I'm not sure about other banks. FCMB, what are you doing on disability? Uh, I, I think beyond what he has said, I, I think most of what he has said is what um, we are doing. Um, it's also good to give. It's also good to give the uh, to indicate that the future is is going to be better because, for example, technology now will allow us to, for example, on the mobile application. They are now voice solutions for those who cannot see. So they can use voice commands, you know, to, to be able to, to do that. I think, in, I think there is one country where they are trialing it. So as soon as these solutions are, you know, are matured, we start implementing them, and that helps the people with disability to access banking services your phone. Uh, better. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session, and we continue to take the conversation into action. Thank you so much. A big round of applause.